Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. When the inspiration comes, you write it down. You just get it out of you. Ideas are very fragile. When we're writing, the biggest thing that I think my responsibility is is like keeping the trains going, keeping the stories going. That's where it's still like a lot of my heavy lifting has never changed. Welcome to another episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast, uh, a special, once again, deep dive episode on a specific topic here at In the Envelope. Uh, today's topic, show running. Being a showrunner, what does that entail? What does that mean? What is the creative process, the logistical process of being a showrunner? Well, we have asked two of the hardest working, most talented showrunners out there of two of my favorite of the backstage staff's personal favorite shows, Ben Sinclair for HBO's High Maintenance. And then we have uh, Prentice Penny, the showrunner uh, and executive producer of HBO's comedy Insecure. Now, what is a showrunner? For those who truly don't know, it is a little bit of a vague term, but generally being a showrunner involves definitely being a writer on the TV show that you're working on. And it usually involves some credit as a producer, whether that's producer, consulting producer, exe- executive producer. And even if you're not the creator or co-creator of the series itself, you're often heavily involved on that level. Uh, many showrunners are also directors, but because this is TV, that just means certain episodes. Um, and as you'll hear in these two, I think, insightful interviews into kind of the insider's look at what being a showrunner really involves. It, it involves a lot of hats, and it involves thinking about both the big picture and the minuscule day-to-day details and how the details inform the big picture. The showrunner, I think, is somebody who is aware of everything that's happening, every choice that's happening on set that day, and how that then feeds into the, the greater vision of those at the very top of the of the project, the creators and the producers of which the showrunner is obviously heavily involved. There's a lot of logistics. There's a lot of like keeping trains moving, you'll hear uh, from these interviews. So first, Ben Sinclair, High Maintenance, for those who don't know, it began as this really beautiful, buzzy, basically series of short form content of short films, each kind of a a look, a snapshot of, of New York life, of New York City culture. And the only common thread between every episode was the guy who is a weed dealer. Um, and he is played by the, sh- the series co-creator, Ben Sinclair, who we will hear from. Prentice Penny uh, met Issa Rae. They both grew up in, in Los Angeles and met as she was developing uh, the misadventures of Awkward Black Girl into what is now the Emmy-nominated hit, Insecure. And... Uh, Prentice is someone who he trained in film school and he worked in a lot of different, a lot of different writers' rooms before becoming the showrunner, co-writer, co-producer, and sometimes director of Insecure. There's also a mention of his beautiful film that came out earlier this year, Uncorked, which was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest and did not. It is now streaming on Netflix. Anyway, this deep dive of a showrunner's episode is coinciding with a ton of awesome content on Backstage recently featured in Backstage Magazine and on Backstage.com about all things showrunner. In last week's issue of the magazine, I'm looking here, we featured showrunners including Kenny Ortega, L. Johnson. On the cover, we had Susan Laurie Parks, who is the showrunner of Genius Aretha and, of course, a Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright. Um, and this fabulous feature, which we will link to in today's episode, on 11 power players in the industry, sort of the top 11 showrunners of Hollywood and the many different projects that they have their fingers in. 
And um, yeah, this is a terrific episode. I'm so glad we, we managed to throw this thing together just before the Emmys this Sunday happening. Uh, best of luck to Insecure, which is nominated for uh, Outstanding Comedy Series, which of course includes Prentice. You'll hear at the end of the Prentice Penny interview, you might hear that uh, things get a little bit cut off. We don't quite have an ending recorded for this interview, but that is also because... Stay tuned for more. We are going to hear more from Prentice. We are going to hear more from old guests. We have a lot of exciting talent and conversations and even new topics planned for In the Envelope. But first, let's get straight to this interview with Ben Sinclair. Another note about the recording on this one. Ben recorded this live from his van, (laughs) which he will, I believe, explain in this interview. But he was on the road following the pandemic. For all I know, he's still in this van. And if you've seen High Maintenance, honestly, it is on point. It is on brand for him and for that character. Um, So it was such a delight. There's such amazing insights on writing advice and on just how TV works in both of these interviews. So let's get to Ben Sinclair. And then after that, we will take a quick break and then get to Prentice Penny. Thank you all for listening. A wearer of multiple Hollywood hats, Ben Sinclair became a pioneer in short-form content with the development, alongside Katya Blickfield, of High Maintenance, episodic New York City stories with one element in common, a weed dealer known as The Guy, began on Vimeo before becoming a critically acclaimed half-hour comedy on HBO. A film, TV, and theater actor, and Writers Guild of America Award winner, Ben is the series' co-creator and showrunner, and stars as The Guy in every episode. Here is our remote interview with Ben Sinclair. It's such a, it's such a loaded question, of course, but like these days, but how are you? Like, how is, um, how is 2020 treating you so far? Okay. Uh, loaded indeed. Uh, I would say that 2020 is, to be honest, it's okay, man. It's, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm okay. Um, we had already been feeling like the show high maintenance was going to have a little pause coming up anyway oh, okay. just that was the general feeling between us just all working together for the past decade like oh it would be nice to you know be like shows like insecure or atlanta or whatever that you know they took a pause and the, yeah. their people went off and did things and then right after we finished the last sound mix on february 26th Hmm. I uh, left New York on February 29th to do some uh, press out here. And then the world changed right then. And then uh, in March, and uh, my agent happened to be selling this van. Uh, He wanted to get rid of it. It's like a camper van and it sleeps four. And I picked up the chairs, but back there is a, it's like a kitchen. and Awesome. Yeah, dude. So I'm, I'm in the van right now, just getting used to living, living out on the West coast for the moment. Right. Cause you're, you're based in New York. You're based in Brooklyn. Yeah, pretty much. I've been mostly in New York for over the past, you know, like I moved into New York in 2007. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm, that's where I've been for the past over 12 years, you know? But uh, I had already been planning on doing some sort of like road trip in uh-huh. July and trying to, uh, I wanted to avoid the, uh, the city buzz of the elections. I used to think it was just going to be the elections that were the uh, scary thing. Yeah, that, uh, exactly. So I have to be honest, I sensed this, I sensed uh, some discord coming and I thought it was going to be the elections. So... I have to say, I've, I've been planning my life accordingly, according to that, and um, huh. and now here I am talking to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a real exercise in going with the flow, and some yeah. things work out perfectly, and some things do not. Yeah, the flow's gonna go whether you go with it or not. So <laughs> yes. Uh, Yes. Not swimming against the current is a pretty good uh, mantra. That's actually great advice. Yes. And I mean, as you know, we're backstage. This is Backstage's podcast. We are all about the, the 
career advice, the acting advice, and even, yes, the life advice. So I think that's... Yeah. People well, can, it's all one and the same, isn't it? Totally, totally. <laughs> um, I would love to hear about those, about the beginning of, beginning of everything. Um, take me back to the beginning. What, what was the goal? When did you get bit by the, shall we say, storytelling bug? Was it acting? Was it writing? Was it movie making? Uh, it was an acting bug. I, okay. I seem to remember in kindergarten, we were, uh, it was like my thespis moment where like the, someone stood out of the group and was like, I am, you know, someone else. I, there was a Frosty the Snowman thing that we were doing in uh, my kindergarten music class. And I remember pretending to be the snowman, like just not moving my arms and keeping my legs stiff and just kind of bouncing around like this. And the teacher really loved it. And then I was like, oh, this is how I win the affection of my elders and, ah. and get recognized positively. Sure, I'll keep doing this. But, you know, I was always had a pretty active imagination anyway. I used uh -huh. to... Uh, but the writing part of me was the part that I've been denying for a long time. But I think mm. it's probably the thing that I've been meant to come to because uh, we started, you know, I came to New York in 2007 with the intention of becoming an actor. I went to mm. the Oberlin for theater and dance. I had, I went to Moscow to study at the Moscow Art Theater. I had a love affair with Chekhov yes. in college that I pursued at Williamstown Theater Festival and then at the uh, NCI Moscow uh, semester. And and then it, I got very disillusioned uh, mm. with theater in Russia because I think I was just hungover, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> Literally and, and then, hungover? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally yeah. hungover. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so much of acting, and I know some of you, the people who read your magazine will understand this, so much of it was about validation and approval. And sure. as I've gone down more and more, I find the most fulfilling approval comes from within, from one's own, se one own mm -hmm. self. And so once I started uh, learning how to do more than just acting, which is being like a, a paint color for a director, you know, just being mm -hmm. um, a, a tone, yes. uh, I enjoyed the control that came from film editing specifically. And in trying to develop my acting reel and, and grabbing footage of unfinished movies and et cetera and projects, mm. I found that I had a talent for editing as well. And then once that, I started to develop that talent, the directing, the producing all stemmed from that as uh, ways to give me an opportunity to act. That's so interesting. Um, I would love to ask about Chekhov. And what this love affair with Chekhov was and why, you know, has that affected high maintenance in any way? Does that affect your life now? Of course. It was so, de there was such a devotion. I did a performance of Three Sisters in college where, I don't know how fun it was to watch, but <laughs> I, I, there is something about how he portrays naturalism yeah. in a way where if you're doing Chekhov right, when it's, your character's like time on stage, you'll play it not just like, oh, this is my moment, but this is a moment in a long line of moments. Right. And most of the uh, story happens off stage. And on stage, people are just kind of talking past each other and yeah. avoiding boredom and, you know, wishing for better things that never happen. And I feel like that's very true to life. So I was very excited that in the uh, early 20th century, somebody was already, before World War I, you know, somebody was thinking like this. Mm. Uh, and I grew up in the suburbs and I identified with that bourgeoisie ennui. So <laughs> I, um, I, I fell in love with it. And um, I actually was cast in the New York Theater Workshop's production of The Three Sisters that was going to go up this spring. And that was Thanks. with the... Uh, really cool cast. Sam Gold is a great director who I've yeah. always wanted to work with. I just was asked if I wanted to participate in it. And uh, I, the reason I was going, to going back to New York in April was to start rehearsals. I mean, we, opening wow. night would have been this week. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah. And it's the most Chekhovian thing that could have ever happened to any <laughs> play ever. 
this yes. play about wanting to be somewhere and hoping you'll get to Moscow, this big city, and then <laughs> you don't get to go. And everyone's like, oh, if only we could go. And then you don't get to go. Like, yes. that's, mwah, that is completely, that is textbook check off. And I am in some ways grateful for that experience. Yes. In a lot of ways, I would say. And we're all just sitting around talking about it completely. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating because it's interesting to think of you as like your reputation now is um, the short film format storytelling kind of guy, but you are a theater kid. It's, this all comes from your theater roots, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, surely. I mean, I just had the most opportunity to do theater as a young person. I think the truth of it is, though, if I had the opportunity to participate in film, I would have been a film kid. Uh, it's just that I grew up right. in Arizona in the suburbs and, you know, school plays were happening. Right. Uh, and I love the theater, but I'm a bigger fan of film. Right. I see. Very cool. And so high maintenance, of course, we at Backstage love asking about anyone who creates their own work, especially in someone like you who started off with just the goal of acting to create their own work. I would love to ask for maybe for those who don't know, what are the, what was the origins of the show? And especially how has, how has the goal of the show changed from then to now? Cause it's, sure. it's pretty the, night and day. The, the origins of the show were, uh, my co-creator and ex life partner, Katsu Blickfeld and I, we uh, met and fell in love in 2000 and, uh, nine. And mm -hmm. that summer we came together and by the next year we were living together in 2010 and by New Year's 2010 to 2011, we were married. And six months into our marriage, we had this idea because I had already acquired this editing knowledge mm. uh, and, and low, uh, low budget film production knowledge that we could have like a little project that would create a community of artists who could cycle in and out about around a common premise okay. and we wouldn't be asking for a devoted set or a devoted core of actors except for myself in order for everybody's schedules to work out hmm. and i had already been making uh internet videos on like two person crew scale you know what i mean hmm. so it felt all very doable just to put a person in a room and have a uh, we, uh, a procedural situation like dealing weed that we could accomplish that. So once we started doing that uh, and we would ask our friends, we wouldn't like make a big effort of getting a lot of people to see it. We weren't like constantly, you know, updating our Twitter account or whatever. We were just sure. finish the project. We'd send it to trusted friends and colleagues. Now keep in mind, Katsi Blickfeld was, uh, a casting director in New York before she, she worked on high maintenance. So she was working on 30 rock and teaching at one-on-one -on -one and, and actors, uh, you know, actors connection and stuff like that in New York. So she had a trove of actors that she wasn't able to cast on 30 mm -hmm. rock that she wanted to use on our show. So we just honestly started doing it. And if we, and if we didn't have the editing knowledge and the, the democratized filmmaking, which is like DSLR cameras and Zoom recorders right. and the help of friends who were in graduate school film for at NYU. Uh, we just, oh, you know, we would have like little weekend parties and make this show happen for not very much money at all. Hmm. Hundreds of dollars. Um, yeah. So uh once we made that for a little while and enough people passed them around to their friends and they were like this is quite good uh we had a television deal that didn't work uh for a pilot we just realized we should just keep doing as much as we as close to what we originally intended to which was to make short stories mm. on the internet so we created a uh relationship with Vimeo who funded our project. And then um, after doing that for a year, because Vimeo allows you to keep creative control of your content, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to take it to HBO the following year after they believed that we were 
uh, we, we could promise them six episodes up front, no pilot deal, just straight six episodes. So right. we said no. We said no to a whole lot of people before that HBO thing because we wanted to make uh-huh. sure that we knew the value of what we were making because we hit it at a very specific time, very specific time before the deluge of web series and people, everything was just two, a minute, two minute comedy videos. No one was trying to do a dramedy, right. uh, which was, that was anything cinematic at the time. So mm. we just kind of hung in there and we've been working on this since 2011. So it, it's been like almost 10 years. And now we just season, we just finished season four on HBO. Yeah. It's so cool. And like you, you were on the cover of Backstage when it was still ju- it, before the HBO thing and talking about it then versus what it's become now. I mean, it's so dramatically different and how fascinating that sort of the original impetus was creating a community. But when you did that, did you imagine that it would be more than a handful of people? Did you imagine, because you now have, what, hundreds of people in the high maintenance community? Yeah, um... I didn't know how, we didn't know how big it would be, yeah. honestly. I know that I have big commune dreams. Uh, <sighs> like, in general, I would love to uh, eat and uh, live near a community of artists and, and scientists and sure. et cetera, who, who we all shared the common goal of, of creation. Mm. Uh, but I didn't realize, you know, how could anyone have known that it would go to HBO? Uh, there's no, I know, I know that I remember one day I'm like, you know, it'd be awesome if this was an HBO show, but that wow. was, that was before we did it. And who knew that that would come true? I think the goal, I think there is a little community that still have fans that are, uh, revolve around yes. the show too. I would say I didn't expect for that. And when that yeah. started we started getting the letters of how much the show meant to people. I, that, that was a pretty stirring development. That's so good. That's so good to hear. And I actually was going to ask like, what kinds of things do people say about the show? Because correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of the core tenant of the show is to really, is to really empathize with people and understand other people's experiences. So do people say that they see themselves? Do they see New York in a different way watching this show? A lot of people reflect that they feel our version of New York is the most closely aligned with the New York that they know, mm. which is nice because, and that makes sense because a lot of our, a lot of what we hope to do in making the show is to not to just not to disturb a natural environment. If we're walking into a place to just let it be how it is instead. Gotcha. You know, of course we have production designers and we have to fake a place for another place sometimes just to yep. make the schedule work. But we like details a whole lot, especially native details. And, you know, while sometimes I think that this show is such a, has been such a personal journal like story generator from Hmm. ripped from the headlines of my life the truth is the more detailed one gets the more universal it becomes yes and and those details contribute to that universality that's so cool because i wanted to ask about the inspiration behind these stories is it a combination of observing you must do a lot of observing new yorkers and wanting to recreate or is it like an organic i've come up with this character or this story and let's go from there it's both at the same time it is wow coming up with the seed of a character a situation a, a feeling an emotion mm. and then we want to recreate that but we are able to be flexible enough to go with whatever happens also whatever actor we come across we Ah. can use their skills to the best advantage in this in this to this it's just adding on you're just layering and layering on the realities that you are confronted with as you make a thing and instead of denying Mm. uh denying something that is happening to be we just embrace whatever is happening so if it's raining in the real life it's raining in the story 
you know right. totally if it's if it's if this person uh can't speak spanish as well as we thought they would be able to maybe that character doesn't speak spanish as well right. as they think they can yeah. so you know it's that kind of thing right which of course as backstage i mean we love hearing about any instance of an actor even changing a story or an actor adding something of themselves that you the creator are then going to tweak something that's maybe catered more to their skills or talents or even personal story that happens to be our philosophy and i have definitely been on sets where people are like no i want it just like this and i have been the uh -huh. director sometimes where i'm like i hear what you're doing but i i'm sorry to tell you but i i would like you to say it exactly like this like mm -hmm. but also you know once you get it on one take you got it yeah so there's you've already set up for that take so you might as well do it a couple of other times and sometimes uh -huh. we'll be watching it in post and we'll be like yeah the way i gave them the line reading sure i did it but that's not the one we're going to use we're going to cool. use the other one because we uh we try to work as efficiently as possible so that we have time to uh, be elastic and flexible okay so is there improv yeah there is i like okay. to think about a scene as like a sandwich where the actor brings the bread they bring the the beginning and the end of the to get us into the scene and okay. then the meat is all written so to speak so sometimes uh you can you can improvise within the meat but it's all i always i don't like it just to go action and somebody starts the lines i like it when people make their way to the dialogue right that is so cool to hear is it the same thing for you as the guy yeah i rarely say the same line Okay. I re I rarely say the say the line every time as written. I I change it. I mm -hmm. whatever feels natural in the moment. Yeah. I say. You do a lot of listening and reacting to to others or to yourself. Yeah, the script the script is just a document to get everyone to show up. It's gotcha. a, yeah. a it's it's a it's a manual for how to put the show together. But that anyone so cool. who's built some Ikea furniture, you know that like after a little bit, you're like, okay, I see how this comes together. Now I'm just going to put this here, you know, you can do right. it exactly right. Nah, that, maybe that's not the best example, but like, it's like cooking. It's more like cooking. You've right. got to taste it as you go and see yes. how you want to modify. Completely, completely. And since you are at the heart of the creation of the show, but also the only character who is appearing in all of it, we ask often about a character building process and actors who have to get into character. Do you have anything like that? Is there like a, a flip you make in order to play the guy versus being you? I think it's probably in the voice and I probably try to get oh. rid of, I have a little, um, well, I have a little bruise here right now. I hit my face on the ocean floor, but oh I, I have like a little, uh, I try to get, lift my eyes up. I try to lift my, I get, my, really? my eyes happen to kind of eat up light. It's just the way my skull is formed. So I, I just, I try to like Whoa. let my eye lids droop a little bit as if I were stoned, but try to lift my eyes up and then here we are, you know? And I, and maybe there's like a little bit of a, like a kind of a purr that happens. His, he starts to slur his words a little bit, like, oh, okay. you know, like just slow it down and try to have fun. You know, it's like I that. See. I see. That's so interesting. I didn't think that there, that you would have like a, a trick, a trick in your back pocket to get into the mindset, I guess. I mean, it, for all intents and purposes, it, People are like, it's you. And I'm like, yeah, it is kind of me. But also, I am putting on different suits all day long to mm. uh, fit into the environment that I, you know. So it's yeah. me and as much as, like, I'm always playing characters in life according to my environment. And the real me, cool. I'm learning on a separate note, more and more to relax into every day and to not try to seek the validation that event that prim primarily got me into wanting to be an actor. Like you said, yeah, if it's all based on uh, getting approval from audiences, you're, um, you're evolving away from that? It's just, 
I, I've gotten the approval and I'm, and gotcha. And it still wasn't enough. Does that make sense? Yes. It of will course. never be. Talk about Chekhov. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're never going to get there. There is no there, there. That's what I'm learning. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and then, and then of course, because I want to ask about partly the writing process is you and Katya, you, you are, I mean, how do you two t- collaborate? Is one of you more of a drafter versus an editor? Is one of you more of a yes, let's pursue this idea, and one is more restrained? It's changed over the years, quite honestly. Mm. I think we've been tutoring each other on, uh, I, like, I've traditionally been better at throwing up a draft and not treating it like it needs to be perfect just to get something on the paper. And she's pretty good at uh, editing and, and taking away from. Mm. And as we have gone through and uh, individuated a little bit more and as both as artists and human beings, uh, you know, we were, the training wheels that we had given each other kind of were taken off a little bit and we both mm. had to learn for ourselves how to do the blocking, how to uh, to take all of the lessons we had learned over the years of doing this and apply them, which is to say, like, knowing what you can fix in post and knowing what you can. And sure, that kind of stuff. And are there a lot of deleted scenes? Is the script for the episode what ends up the final episode? There's definite, it's def, it's, it varies episode to episode, but I think that many of the scenes are augmented uh a lot of times in the post-production i mean honestly i haven't i don't think i've ever gone and read a script after we've turned in the draft like i would be interested to actually see at some of the drafts that we started with yeah you know the the easiest episode the best episodes in my opinion are the ones that flow right out of you and it's pretty much the first draft which is the final draft the dog episode took yeah. 45 minutes to write or two hours to write or something like that. And it remained largely intact except for some casting changes and et cetera, et cetera. And then, so, you know, and a lot of times the script changes because of production limitations. So uh, all in the process of producing, we have to uh, be very flexible uh, with what will with, with what works. Luckily, because we're not such a plot-heavy show, sometimes episodes mm. are more plot-heavy than others, but because right. it's not so dependent on transitive properties of A plus B equals C, sure. it's more of a tone poem. We can, we can select different tones in the same orchestra. Uh-huh. Is it true also that the production restraints you're talking about can sometimes like add fuel to the inspiration and and more creativity okay definitely i think constraints are you know whatever it says necessity is the mother of invention i think it's that's related to constraints as well it's a little scarier to go swimming in the ocean than it is to go in a lake or a swimming pool sure so the the container for your ideas uh, helps form them better because if you just have uh, an ability to pull whatever, right, it's you. You it, it might be overwhelming. Right, like where do you begin? Yeah, yeah, totally. Have you found the secret to success to getting to that the thing you're talking about with the dog episode of like you're in the zone and it just comes out and those are you consider the best ones? Is there a secret, the secret- to that, or is it? The secret to success is when the inspiration comes, you write it down. Right away. Okay. You just get it out of you. Okay. Ideas are very fragile mm. and inspiration is very, very fragile. And wow. I have a, I'm lucky to have like a pretty great memory despite being a stoner still, but sure. write it down. Just, just like yeah. write it down. And if you can't write it down, I mean, there's no reason not to. We all have phones pretty much, right? Totally. Like, just yeah. get it out of you. And don't worry about editing it while you're, you're getting it out of you. You'll have so time point. to edit later. Yeah, 
Totally. Just get it. Just get the draft done. Maybe. Just get it out of you. However, yeah. tell it to somebody else. A lot of my process mm. is talking because when I tell oh. things, when I say things out loud, then I have an easier time remembering them and formulating yeah. them. So I, I love to work with in, uh, uh, in a, a duo because yeah. it, it is a dialogue uh, situation. Right. Do you think of it as a, do you think of it as a muse? Cause you're talking about this idea that inspiration is fragile. Yeah, it sure. It's you. a muse. It's whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what, you know, it's a muse in that is it's amusing to you. It lights you up. Oh, you know what I mean? Anything that you're like, ah, that's it. You know, it lights oh, you yeah, up. We'll just do it like that. That's being amused. You know what I mean? It's yeah. this. So I don't know that there are like demons and spirits out there that strike you. Right. I, but I do know that some days you are more open to receive those things than others. And you can meditate or you can do all these things. You can try to clear your mind. The, the truth is, some, when you're lit up, that's a sign that it's worth pursuing. Interesting. I love hearing, we love hearing the writing advice. Is there, are there other things, do you have anything resembling like a structured routine for writing? Or do you have advice for someone who's just starting off with screenwriting? There are three rules to writing. Just write. Okay. Ass and chair and write, and uh, write. I think it's all just, I think that's just it. You just have to do it. I have no routine because I, for some reason, even though I think I know it's the key to mm. the beginning of a project, it just is the first step. Right. I still am resistant to it. I still, these are things I still have to remind myself and tell myself because my natural inclination is writing sucks. But uh, hmm. first draft, I mean, just get it out. Just get it out of you. And, and, and yes, it is hard. Yes, writing is hard. We all know it's hard. Every writer will tell you it's hard. Ooh, yeah. yeah, but that's just how it's done. There's no way around it. Interesting. That's interesting to hear you say that you, yeah, that it's maybe sometimes an antagonistic relationship. Like, you mentioned you really like editing. First of all, are there different hats to writing, editing, directing, and then also like is producing sort of all of it? Does it bleed together? Yeah, there are different hats, but I've been trained to wear all those hats at the same time. So okay. yeah, it, it is different, but uh, I've been exercising the skill of, of wearing all the hats for a long time. So I, totally. I, I, did, I got to direct an episode of Dave uh, for their first season. And uh -huh. it was it was really cool just to wear the one hat, but also Dave uh, Dave Bird, who is the, basically an analog for me in high maintenance. You know what I mean? Show creator, showrunner, lead yeah. actor, etc. Because I understood what he was going through, I knew when to, I knew what he might have wanted from me in that situation, which is mm. to say, just help just help him do what he wants to do. And even if I think it's not going to lead to a place that works for mm. him, I know that if I were in that situation, I would just want to be able to at least have it done the way I want. And then me could offer him options in case he wanted something else Ooh. and we had time to do it. But the first thing was to get what he wanted done. Yeah. It sounds like that process is about collaborating and there's, there's no ego, right? There's no like, I'm asserting there is ego, myself. But as it a... doesn't help. Ah, There's okay. plenty of ego, but <laughs> there always it's is. just that that's always just something you have to work past. <laughs> okay. Not not suppress or like just work past, I guess. I mean, listen, if you're gonna feel a feeling, you're gonna feel a feeling. And if you're gonna repress yeah. that feeling, then it's gonna come up later in a bad way. So feel your feeling in a safe space. Uh try to, you know. Uh, do whatever you need to do to get it uh, to get honor that feeling, but then yeah, then that. let it go. Just don't. But suppressing is is repression and suppression. I mean, maybe suppression is different than repression. But in my experience, that always comes out the other end in, a, in an unexpected, nasty way. Yes, yes, <laughs> it's yep, it's spot on. I appreciate you taking the time. Could we hear from you? Just um, one last piece of advice. If the, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? 
like I said at the beginning, go with the current. Don't mm. swim against the current. Just go with it. It's happening whether you think it should be or not. So just go with it. Hey, are you ready? Yes, you, listener. Are you ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in today's interview and use it in your own acting career? Is it something maybe you've always considered doing? Are you at the very beginning of your acting career? Are you well into your acting career and you're a fan of this podcast and you're ready to take those next steps? Backstage is here for you. This podcast is brought to you by Backstage and what we are offering listeners to this podcast is a free 30-day trial. That's right. We are giving you 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. All you need to do is go to checkout, backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code ENVELOPE. That's right. If you enter the code ENVELOPE at checkout, E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E, that's how you spell ENVELOPE, you get 30 free days on backstage.com. Browse our thousands of casting notices. Learn why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you are an actor and you haven't signed up yet for Backstage, I don't know what to tell you. Get on it. Prentice Penny got his start in Hollywood writing on the hit sitcom Girlfriends before contributing to the writer's room on, and often producing, Scrubs, Happy Endings, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and more. For four seasons, he's been the showrunner and executive producer of Issa Rae's HBO hit Insecure, which is currently nominated for eight Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Comedy Series. Prentice also wrote and directed the acclaimed 2020 Netflix film Uncorked. Here's our chat with multi-hyphenate Prentice Penny. We've spoken backstage before. I know you kind of know um, our deal. But first of all, hi, Prentice. Congratulations hi. on your Emmy nomination. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very well deserved. Um, it's... You you said in a deadline piece, I also want to ask you about, that uh, Insecure is the fourth ever Black show to be nominated for the comedy series Emmy. So um, did you know that going into it? I mean, what what is your reaction to that record or that uh, fact? Uh, uh, what's that? Um, <laughs> I didn't know it until I was writing the deadline hmm. piece. And I think I was actually maybe wrong. I think it's been maybe five. I mean, still not <laughs> great since the 50s. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, no, so I didn't really know until then. And then that really disturbed me because I thought about, um, I've really seen a lot of the shows that I thought about so many shows that have been created by, by all people of color. Um, yeah. And just the failure to sort of recognize their art, um, and in some way, it's a, a, a an unacknowledgement of their humanity, right? Because all of everybody's art is sort of expressed, everybody's humanity is sort of expressed in art, yes. um, and so wow. the, the unacknowledgement of sort of like. You know, we think Hollywood, it's so funny, like politically, you know, you hear politicians on the right sort of say the liberal Hollywood and the liberal left and Hollywood. And there, Hollywood has its own, you know, right wingish, you know, sort of energy sure. um, of like, you know, it's like it's assumed that like, oh, everybody in Hollywood just understands race and culture and identity. And it's like, no, it has its own problems. Yeah, It's a part of America. So it has its own problems with it as well. So totally. um, I don't love that. Obviously, those facts, I, I would love to get to a place that we're never, um, it's not considered to be one of the only ones or to feel like, oh, this is the year that more people of color are nominated. I, I would, that is even disturbing sometimes to hear that it's like, oh, because that also implies that like yeah. the next year, okay, you got your, you know, like you got your cookie this year, so don't yep. complain next year. You know, it's, it just has like, a, it's kind of a gross energy around it. So really? I'm There's just like glad the show's. Batting. Yeah, it's like, okay, we've ignored it for 15 years. Here's one, you know? <laughs> um, right. You know, it's like when Mitch McConnell was like, well, you just had Obama. What are you complaining about? You know? Totally. And, it's that. And, you know, yeah. 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 And I love this idea that the art we make reflects our humanity. That's so true. And it reflects our culture and where yeah. we are at culturally and, and historically. So, 100%, 100% agree. It's, uh, it's slow progress. It's two steps forward, one step back, I guess. And yeah. it depends on how yeah. you look at it. But, it's so it's so thrilling that Insecure season four, you know, is getting the recognition that it that it really deserves. Um, 
take me back to the beginning. I mean, we are backstage and I would love to ask you about like how to become an Emmy nominated showrunner. <laughs> but like you've worked on a lot of different TV shows and mm -hmm. you've written and you've done lots of different roles. Um, talk to me about your journey. First of all, how did you, how did you get into it? What was the initial dream? Uh, the initial dream was always to be like a writer. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the short version is I grew up an only child. And so being creative, you kind of had to be, you know, it wasn't like cool. my, my mother, my father was really busy with work and my, my parents were divorced and my mom was going to law school and like working a day in law school at night. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents after school and I was the only child. And it, it wasn't like grandparents now where you're like, you know, grandparents today are like super active. They're on Facebook. Like they're, they move <laughs> through the world. Like they're just like sure. millennials. But, you know, grandparents back in the 80s were like, grandparents you know like you know you sort of sat in front of the tv on like a floor model tv and like you know you watch the news for you know three o'clock four o'clock five o'clock you know it was like hey let's go do this you know it was like you know it was very traditional um so i had kind of had to make my own stories and make my own little adventures mm -hmm. but um, but that's where it sort of it stemmed from. And then um, I ended up going to film school at USC um, mm -hmm. and for screenwriting and sort of, you know, after graduation, did a myriad of jobs, some in the business, some not in the business, but none as a writer on a television show. Um, and mm -hmm. then around 2004, I got my first job on a show called Girlfriends that was written yeah. by Mark Rocket Keel, who's an amazing writer. And that sort of was the first thing I got. And that was such an amazing experience because one, Mara was just so welcoming and it treated me like, you know, just a writer. I was like a diversity hire. It, it, it wasn't even called a diversity hire. It was just some program that was similar to gotcha. that. That, yeah. that Mara had done on Moesha. And so she was a big believer of the program. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's sort of how I got my job. And then eventually she hired me as a full-time writer and I was there until the show ended for four years. Um, and that was a great experience and just taught me so much and to be around so many writers of color who were so talented. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was also frustrating because you know, I wasn't seeing a lot of those writers also get, besides Mara getting the spinoff for the game, I wasn't seeing like writers on my staff who I knew were insanely talented get pilots or like get offered right. overall deals, you know, mm -hmm. which is like in, insane to think about um, because that show is on for eight years. You know, it's like if Friends is on for that long, you know, people get all kinds of overall deals. You know, Seinfeld ended so many years ago and people still get big overall deals from being on that show, but right. it wasn't the reverse for shows of color. Um, and so, then I sort of, then I sort of, when all those shows, after the writer's strike, shows of color were getting canceled. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that's when I sort of was my, that was sort of my entryway into being solely on on, on shows by uh, white showrunners and being the only right. sort of one in the room. And then that was a different dynamic to hear those conversations in the room was because I was hearing about big overall deals and, you mm -hmm. know, people have one, two pilots and things. I was just hearing conversations I was not hearing from the writers on the shows of color. And that's when I sort of realized like, oh, there's this sort of treatment of uh, the Hollywood as like black shows are the Negro leagues and white shows are the major leagues. Like that's when I was like, oh, cause I'm hearing conversations and opportunities that they, the writers weren't any more talented than the writers I was working with on sure. girlfriends. It sure. was just again, opportunity. And so, um, and that was, just, that was sort of how I started getting on, um, like do not disturb, uh, scrubs, happy yeah. endings, uh, breaking in Brooklyn nine, nine. And that was sort of my like eight year run of, uh, being uh, on those shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting that your first impression, I guess, of a writer's room was, it's safe to say the girlfriend's writing room was super diverse. Was super yeah, I mean, it was, I would say it was probably was like 70, 30 black to white. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much like, um, I didn't go to an HBCU, but my, but my wife went to Spelman and she often talks about what that feeling was like, where everybody's yeah. super encouraging and supportive because we're all here together. And that's what that experience felt like to me. Like... There was no agendas. There was no, it was feel free to say whatever you want and ask whatever you want. And just to be around that, to, you know what I mean? That was very, uh, cause I also grew up in a house where like, you know, all my family went to college and uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, and like my mother was a lawyer and I had family members that were, you know, like chemists and engineers and dentists and doctors. So like, it wasn't a big, like going to college was just assumed. So it was like, you yeah. know, it's just that we, like when you grow up in a house where you're like, oh, this is just what we do as a family. It's not bizarre to think about going to college. Like, yeah, that's just what's expected. So that's what that room felt like. It was like, oh, everybody here is like black and 
super talented and creative and funny and smart. Mm-hmm. So like, yeah, this is like, you know, this is what it should be. Like, you know what I mean? And like, not, that's not be. like a weird thing. And so to, yeah. to be around that was very nurturing as opposed to feeling like I had to start in a space where I was the, the only one, yeah. um, even though I had grown up in spaces like that growing up. So that prepared me for when I did need to be the only one. Cause when I was in film school, there were only two black students, myself and with some other person um, mm-hmm. in my film class. So it was, I had, and I had grown up in summer camps where I was the only one. So I kind of had experiences at a young age of like being the only one. So when those things happened, it didn't frighten me, but yeah. it still didn't. I wish it still wasn't like that, but I wasn't intimidated by being in those spaces. Right. Like going at, for, after girlfriends into other into other rooms, it wasn't necessarily a huge shock. It's just that your introduction to the industry was maybe not what most writers of color in Hollywood get introduced to. Yes, <laughs> I would, yes, yes. figured out what the norm is, I guess. Yes, yes, exactly. And you start to recognize these systemic issues that you're talking about, of course. Yeah. Because we are backstage, can I ask you about Insecure and the many different hats that you wear? Sure. We'll switch gears here over to producing versus directing versus writing. You've spoken to backstage before about how when you work with Issa, you have two different relationships with her. Like, for example, when you're directing her, is this all of a piece, or do you do different hats? When I'm, when we're, yeah, that's a great question. And we, we and obviously the relationship continues to evolve. You know, because mm. when she didn't, when she had never done television before, obviously she was leaning on me in a much different way in certain areas. Mm. And now that she's done it, she leans on me less in certain ways, in certain areas. And I've like, that's the whole point, right? It's like, I, it's like, if you have, if you have kids, you're like, oh, I don't, at 15, I shouldn't have to like still do this or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, you know how to do this now. You just don't need me, right? So there's, um, I will say that like, when we're writing, the biggest thing that I think my responsibility is, is like keeping the trains going, keeping the stories going. Um, that's where it's still of like a lot of my heavy lifting has never changed over the mm-hmm. course of the series. Um, uh, and obviously, as Issa has gotten more busy in her just other areas of her life, it, it's also an area that like cause sometimes she'll be like, "Oh, I have to go do this this commercial. I have to go speak at a thing. So like, I'm going to be gone for three days. So you know what I mean? Because she's just is like, and that's she's a cover girl. She's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it, so 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 that part of keeping the trains going is very much still in my wheelhouse. Um, so that's the writing and producing part. There are certain things that she's just, and when we start in production, there are things that she is re- like really focused on like she her like her things when it comes to like you know like wardrobe and music and things like that are Um, things that she is very very focused on so those are mm -hmm. things that i don't have to like worry about um but then there'll be other things that i'm dealing with like with the first ad's and things like that in terms of the production meetings and stuff like that with certain directors that that i am doing more on my producing side because she's also shifting she also is shifting into acting mode. And when she's in acting mode, yeah. but so, there are certain, again, there are certain areas that, of the show that she's like, I always want to make sure this is extra, extra tight. That That is like, I don't touch because I because she wants it. I know a very certain way. Um, and then, but, but, but when she's in acting mode, I, then I'm taking all of those things off. So then I become a little bit more in producing mode. And certainly when I'm, di- when I'm directing, she's just yeah. really in as an act. She, that is the one thing that I'm constantly amazed at her with is that she is great at like, I am right now all this hat and nothing else. Gotcha. Um, so very, like very rarely when we're filming, she really is like whatever the directors do, I am just um, an actress right now. Um, you know, sometimes she'll say like, "Hey, this thing doesn't really look right to me," but but those are like very specific things. Uh, but for the most part, she's so respectful of, and also acknowledging that like she's also the other actor's boss. So like, right. you know, so there's that level I think where she's really great at making sure when she's acting, she's acting just like them, and it's not like oh you know, hey, I'm giving notes to actors. She never like does, I've never seen her do that, not once. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, she's just like, it's really in actress mode. Um, and so when I'm when I'm directing her, and I'm really just kind of in directing mode at that at that point, I really try to like, uh, and the, 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 the greatest part is we have uh, two other of our EPs kind of supervise every other episode. So like while one is prepping, one is filming and they're kind of, so, 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 so if I have to bounce back and forth between like editing or set or, you know, finished scripts, there's always an EP covering set. 
Um, so a lot of times when I'm in director mode, I'm not trying to think about producing stuff because I have another producer who's sort of that's their focus when I'm directing just because yeah. there's just so much stuff to focus on when I'm directing that I try to just kind of keep my focus straight ahead hmm. on what needs to be done from that standpoint. So I, that's a, that's a shift I had to make. Um, and I try to still do producing, you know, showrunner stuff while I'm directing because it just requires all of your focus. Um, so yeah, so it, it really ping pongs, but, but when I'm directing her, I'm just really thinking about directing. And when I'm not directing her, I'm more so thinking about it from a showrunner's perspective, uh, of, of balancing, you know, what the directors are doing with her, um, along with still moving the trains on the show. Amazing. Yeah, gosh, that's amazing. And it, it sounds like it's like, especially maybe four seasons in, it's a well-oiled machine. But correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't know Issa, like this is your first time being the showrunner of a show, and you didn't know the creator of the show before, after, it was after Awkward Black Girl and before it became an HBO show, you connected with her, right? Yeah, and what you, happened was... You, you just hit it off? Yeah, what happened was um, I was on Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Larry Wilmore who uh, wrote the pilot with her. The show got picked up, but Larry couldn't be there for the pilot or run the show because he got his show after The Daily Show, The Nightly Show on Comedy Central, and they were mm -hmm. looking for somebody. And so um, I read the script and I was like, this is amazing. And like, I had so many shared experiences and um, we, mm -hmm. you know, we grew up in the same neighborhood. I knew exactly this world. I had worked in nonprofit. I, I just, Every black person knew that pilot of Insecure. We all felt that show. And so, and wanted to see different, you know, at that point I had also been on like white shows for eight years. And I was like, I wanted, I was the only black person in any of these rooms. And so yeah. I was like, I just want to be around other, like see one other black person today. Like I was like, I can't yeah. imagine like a white person being on a show or being in a working and being like, I don't see any white people ever throughout my day. Uh, I just can't imagine that for them. So, but that was my life. So, sure. um, so I met my, my agent at the time, or she still is my agent, went to college with Issa and also uh, uh, Lena Waith. Obviously, we, we all know Lena. Uh, I met, so, so, Lena, so Lena and I worked on Girlfriends together. And like Lena was what, like one of the showrunner's assistants when uh, the last season of the show. So Lena and I hit it off and we became friends. And then when I was on other shows, Lena and I would just happen to be on the lot together. So, so we just have stayed friends throughout this whole, or since I've met, I've known her in almost 13 years now. And, um, and so she was also friends with Issa. And so I just asked both of them, would they put in a word or whatever? And then I wrote Issa a letter about why I thought I would be a good person to partner oh, with. Cool. And uh, they gave it to her, she read it and she liked it. And then we met. And then we realized like, oh, we grew up like one street over from each other in View Park. And then we, because we're 10 years apart in age and we lived across the street from each other at the time in Inglewood, uh, which we did, we learned that. And then we just learned that we had a lot of friends in wow. common and we just, I knew what she wanted to do. And I just said, hey, this is what I hope I feel I can offer. And like after 15 minutes, we just were cracking each other up. We had never met, but you know, you just kind of like, we just cracked each other up. We just like joked and had fun in the meeting. And after like 15 minutes, we were just like, should we? Yeah, let's do it. And that's how it happened. And that was it's meant to be Geez, almost five and a half years ago now. <laughs> sure. And I'm sure it's just been such a such a whirlwind ever since. Oh, yeah. It's been um, a crazy thing. And it's so cool to hear about the different hats because that I guess that really is required, especially when her name is Issa. She's playing a character named Issa. <laughs> right. So there has to be like a delineation of like, yeah. I am in this mode and then I am in this yeah. mode. That's super interesting. Um, and you mentioned, of course, when she's in actor mode. Um, talk to me about acting. I got to let you go soon. But yeah. What is great acting to you? Like, what do you look for in the audition room? Uncorked has such, such beautiful performances. Oh, thank you. Yo, that, that's yeah. a, um, yeah, those... Uh, Mamadou, Nisi, and Courtney. I mean, that's the thing, too, when you just try to, like... And that's one thing it taught me, just, like, the, being on Insecure, is, like, just find good actors. Like, names are fine, mm -hmm. but people will watch mm -hmm. stuff just when you have good performances at the end of the day. Like, that's all that really matters. And so... But one of the things that I do... One of the things I definitely look for every time, and this was, this show, this happened on Uncorked as well, um, I always look to see what actors do when they're not talking in the audition. Mm -hmm. I look to see how actors okay. fill the space. Um, I look to see if an actor is just waiting to talk again, or are they, <laughs> what, what, cause I was like, that's real life. Like people do things in real life 
while they're listening to you, they're processing what you're saying. And so I can, I've gotten, I believe, good at noticing yeah. what actors do when they don't talk. So that's one thing that I me If an actor is like just waiting to talk, I just go, because I go like in the edit, I may not know, I may not, because nobody edits like, you talk, I talk, you talk, I talk, and I edit right. it that way, right? Sometimes it might be more interesting to do the scene where I never see you. The, 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 the story point might be on the person who's processing the information or vice versa. Yeah. I might be, be on the cool. one who's listening the whole time. And if you can't give me anything that's like while you're listening and like you feel kind of like, I just feel like you're just waiting to talk or you feel kind of empty, then I just go like, I, 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 I'm, I'm limited now because now I'm like right. cutting to save a performance as opposed to like mm -hmm. letting the camera go. And like that was one of the things on Uncorked was like, I knew I wanted to shoot things that would just be kind of long takes because I was like, oh, this is a movie that only, it's like Uncorked isn't a special effects movie. It's not this kind of a movie. It's just performance based. So I need performances yes. to be great because I just want the camera to sometimes roll a lot and not have to cut or cut when I have to or cut for emphasis. And so that that's a thing that um, I definitely look for immediately. That's the first thing I look for is what do you what are you doing when you're not speaking? That's all I'm that's mostly all I'm looking at during the audition. That's exactly what actor listeners of this podcast, that's exactly what, what they need to hear. So thank you. Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Brow Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.